irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Razor Riffs with Keith Razor and Alan Lee right here on LA Talk Radio. All right, guys, welcome to the show. Keith Reza with my uh, the one and only Alan Lee. Alan, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing very good, you know, but uh, uh, talking through this mask, you know, when you inhale, it's it's a bitch. Oh, take off the mask. And, uh, oh, no, no. Oh, you want to do the whole interview with the mask on? This is this is Corona, bro. This is this is what we do. Oh, well, I mean, how does how do I sound? Do I sound clear? Let me see. I could do it with a mask. Yeah, I mean, on. it's up to you. If you want to, they you just want... said bring the mask for the parking lot. Oh, did, well, did she have her mask on? Our yeah. producer. Yeah. No, she didn't have it when she came in here. No, she did. Oh, she had it on. Yeah. But well, I mean, she has I, it on. I find it hard to interview with yeah. a mask on. But if you want to do it and be safe, you know, well, you're more tell you power what, to you. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to test this for half the interview. Half the interview. Yeah, and then I'll take it off. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll try that, too. That sounds sexy, doesn't it? Yeah, that does sound a little sexy. Yeah, well. I, uh, <laughs> uh, before we get into it, I wanted to give uh, the folks a quick uh, update because this year has been kind of tough. We're back season eight right now. And uh, but uh, there's no comedy. Yeah. So all my shows are got can do the, you know, to this thing. Sure. And uh, my special comes out uh, on Friday Good. for one hour. Congratulations. So you guys should buy that. Yeah. Uh, you can buy it at www.keithrays.com and also on Sony. Oh. Yeah, that's when it's been uh, released on yeah. Mad Records. Sony. Yeah, Keith Rays and Make It Happen. It's going to be on iTunes and yeah, everywhere. It's fantastic. It's 15 bucks, Alan Lee. One hour mm-hmm. special. I'm worth 15, right? 15 what? Dollars. Well, let's not get carried away, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then i'm also i don't know if i told yeah. you but i'm also on celebrity mm-hmm. voicemail that's right yeah that's so right. you could book me yeah. if you go to www.celebritivoicemail.com slash keith reza r-e-z-a yeah. you could book me and i'll give you a personal shout out i'll tell you yeah. you know i'll say whatever you want to hear no so, filter you know what i mean like i don't care if i Wish you a happy birthday or tell your boss to eat a dick you know that's probably not the best advice right now <laughs> but with cor- you mean with Corona? Yeah. Or all the time? All the time. But what I'm saying okay. is I'm willing to do it <laughs> if you book me. Yeah. So how are you doing, Alan? I'm, I'm doing very well. Um, you know, uh, I have a small amount of income coming in because I'm a government employee and the government takes care of its people, you know, and I, uh, yeah. I, I you know, I got, did you get your, uh, t- uh, your uh, uh, $1,200? Yeah. yeah, you're not supposed to tell people how much you make, though. No, no, like, no, no, that's no, like no, 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 hold on, hold on, wait, it's just a oh, moment. Oh, you, you, okay, you, right. you, 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 no, oh, I mean about the money that the stock, oh, right, that the was Trump sent. Money. Yeah, yeah. yeah, did you get it yet? Yeah, I did. Good. Yeah. So I got that, oh, yeah. and um, and uh, I got some, you know, from the government, uh, from the uh, school district, and and, and um, you know, so it, it's 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 okay. I'm, I mean, you know, I I'll tell you one thing. It's been a little bit of a party for me. Right. Okay. Because what I do, uh, I've got a big television collection, uh-huh. okay? And I, I, you're too young to remember Honey West with the, with the cougar, and she's a detective. Uh, Aaron Spelling, who did Ch- Charlie's Angels, did Honey West. No, no, I remember. Did you? Did you yeah. see with your dad and some kind of... Uh, no, no, I'm just saying A&E? I remember for the sake of this bit. To... Oh. <laughs> well, well you're, you're very good at just, you know, that's why we're a team. You just say yes to anything. <laughs> so... <laughs> So you know, uh, uh, and so I got. Uh, to would you binge. like to fuck me up the ass? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, see, so here we go. Here we go with the blue material. Which is not even. What's it? How wait, wait, four minutes? We gotta call our guests in one minute. So yeah. We, so anyway, you know, I've been I've been binge watching. You've been watching anything? Or I you, you I still... did actually. I finished uh, Ozark. You finished. You finished that. Great. I didn't think I didn't think you would like that. I I loved it. I really did. Do, do you? Did you really? <laughs> yeah. I thought. It was funny, and it was great, and I can't go on and on about Ozark. But what I want to go on and on about is our guest today. Oh, a, my. We have shit. a great guest, this and his credits are unbelievable, incredible. right? He's not just his credits, man. He's a cool dude. Yeah, he's a cool guy. He's, 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 he's just amazing. He is the great Mark Brazil. For the folks at home who don't know who Mark Brazil is, he was a writer for the Dennis Miller Show, right? He created uh, that 70s show. The eighties, too. The thir- the eighties show, the the sound, the the sequel, you know, shall we yeah, say? Sure, sure. 
because you know seventies and then eighties, sure. and then uh, in living color. Do you know in living color. color, and the Chevy Chase show. Chevy Chase. So it's going to be great because we're going to get a lot of information from what it's like to be a stand-up and a great writer. Yeah, right? yeah. I, you know, he's he's a very interesting fellow because uh, uh, he he's he he doesn't he doesn't boast about his career. Well, we're going to get him to boast well, right now, well, just, buddy. Just, okay, well, maybe, hopefully he answers the phone. <laughs> <laughs> we're calling the great Mark Brazil. When he picks up, let me introduce you. Oh, it's very sweet of you. Oh, yeah? How sweet, what a sweet thing to say. Yeah. I can't hear it all. What? I hear you perfectly. Hey, Mark? Uh, did the lady, like... Turn off the. Can you go to the director to see? Can you hear me? The oh. get the the producer to see if we can fix this phone line. Oh, it's not ringing. No, I couldn't hear anything. It's ladies and gentlemen, technical difficulties. We just need to turn the volume up. I apologize. Hey, how are you? So the phone rang, but I couldn't hear. <laughs> I couldn't, like, raise the volume up on oh. the phone. Can you show me how to do that? Because it rang, and then he hung Wait up. a minute. Wait, hold on a second. Okay, so that that's for the phone. Okay, excellent. Cool. Hello? Excellent. We'll try again. The great Mark Brazil. Is he there? Mark? I can't hear him. Can you hear him? Uh, I don't hear you. I hear yeah, you. I hear me, too. You don't hear him? Did it ring and he picked up? I didn't even hear it ring. It says I'm connected to him, so I think he could hear it. Hello? I don't hear the great Mark Brazil on the phone. Hang up and call again. Mark, I got to hang up and call you again if you're there. All right, I apologize. Okay, hang up and call again. <laughs> okay, so it's not ringing here. Is there a button we got hit? Hey, Mark, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, excellent. Oh, cool. Beautiful. Jesus, I thought. Uh, we had uh, phone issues. Did you hear me the first time? Yeah, I heard you. You couldn't, uh, but uh, you couldn't hear me, huh? Yeah. Uh, uh, you want to know what the problem was? Uh, it was on mute. Yeah, well, that's 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 kind of a little problem. You know, you're amazing at this tech stuff. I I, I learned so much on this show. <laughs> I apologize because I love you, Mark, and I feel like this oh, is already the geez. worst interview you've ever done. If oh, I muted just, you, <laughs> let me warn you when he starts no. when he starts. I love you. you like listen, I'm glad to have you, Mark. <laughs> uh, Mark, this is uh, the sidekick, Alan oh. Lee. Alan, oh. this is the great Mark Brazil. So glad to meet you, sir. And uh, we have a lot in common. Like like Night. what? Like cowboy I mean, boots, something you would you would not understand. Cowboy boots. <laughs> Do you wear cowboy boots, Mark? Oh, last time I. I uh, yes, I. Uh, see, I wear ostrich. <laughs> oh dear! It's, look, I told you this is a man. <laughs> this is an alpha male. It's not you know this uh, guy. This guy knows what he's talking. Let, let me ask. Let me ask him something. Just a, a quick. <laughs> shit. Uh, Mark, what is your favorite western? Like you, know, you can pick. Uh, Jamestown. Oh. I think he oh. said uh, Tombstone. Tombstone. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. You say what? What's wrong? Can you? No. I'm sorry, sir. What did you say again? Uh, Tombstone's my favorite. Oh, uh, Tombstone. That's what Josie. I said. Thank you. Thank you. Tombstone. Oh Tombstone. Jesus. Uh, well, I, that's that is one of my favorites. But g going a little back in time, did you like the Magnificent Seven? That's one of my favorites. Yeah, I I liked the uh, Magnificent Seven. However, I thought the Wild Bunch was probably a there little better there's he ah. this is a connoisseur he knows well i, I like the wild bunch it's hard for me but magnificent seven is one of my top red river you know with wayne and, and Mont montgomery cliff <laughs> alan's a big red, western guy red, i am i'm a huge western man a, a huge i grew up in texas right. not that that means anything with my western but you know yeah uh, a fetish I, I spent a lot of time in texas i i used to go to a lot of horse shows there so oh, um, you used to go to but, a lot of horse shows there Horse shows. Oh, yeah. horse, horse, horse shows. shows. Jesus horse Christ. Shows. <laughs> I, um, I, they should have horse shows, though, so you could <laughs> kind of pit before you spend the money well, to see 
you know. Yeah. Well, well, they have horror <laughs> shows. Yeah. Like, you know, horror, horror, and horse. This guy always, like, kills my jokes. I'm sorry, Mr. Kills? Brazil. <laughs> you know, well, uh, does I guess... Does he kill them or does he elevate them? Oh. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so, uh, for the folks at home, I just wanted to give a little background on how I met you, Mark. I met you at the Slow Comedy Festival, mm-hmm. and you gave me a ride to the motel, and that was very sweet of you. Well, um... I really thought you were funny. I thought we were, we had a good time. And I know that, uh, I don't know. It seemed weird. The, uh, transportation up there. So, uh, it, it was, was a little more weird. Thank you back there. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And we had a good talk. And, uh, so like, basically I just want to let you know when I knew I was going to interview you today, I watched double dragon. Oh, Oh, I put in quite a performance in that. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> But uh, I didn't. I didn't know you. Uh, that that was, that was your, your first movie you wrote. Have you written any other movies? Um, no, I didn't write that movie. I was uh, brought in to rewrite that movie, and then they liked me, so they, you know, kept me there for the production in in uh, Cleveland. And uh, you know, it was it was weird. It's like that company, though. Funniest thing about that company it was like three brothers from India, and they would make. John Claude Van Damme movies mostly, but they had a guy in their office uh, way back when who uh, was a reader for them. He, they would read, he would read their scripts, and he had given them a script that he had written himself, and he had said, "Hey, would you guys consider making this movie?" But they were just they made like horror movies or kung fu movies overseas, mm-hmm. recouping whatever. They were they were those guys, but the movie was uh, Reservoir Dog. Whoa. Whoa. And they passed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my. And, and they said yes yeah. to Double Dragon? I know. Isn't that horrible? <laughs> no, the guy who wrote Double Dragon, um, I'm trying to remember now, I believe, oh, he's the uh, creator and exec producer with Vince Gilligan on Better Call Saul. It's oh, Peter Gould. Wow. Wow. Love that yeah. show. That's a great show. I, I rewrote, uh, that's another movie. I rewrote Homeward Bound. Um, I don't know if you remember that movie. Oh, was, I love uh, that movie. It was about the the dogs who were trying to get back home. Yeah, that, it was uh, Don Amici mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, wow. Michael J. Fox and uh, Sally Field. And um, then I had rewritten uh, That Darn Cat with which starred uh, Christina Ricci and Coolio. And I spent a couple weeks, I think in North Carolina on that movie. And, uh, but you know, um, I didn't get credit on it. Even I just, you know, was brought in to rewrite them. And, uh, that darn guy, cat was one of my favorites. My, my friend, Dougie Doug was the star in that. Right. Did I say Coolio? I, meant yeah. that. <laughs> I was like, he changed his name to too- Coolio. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Wait a second uh, uh, I but the guys who wrote that movie were the uh, Kara, uh, Alexander and Karaszewski yeah. who wrote uh, Ed Wood and the and the people for her, the Larry Flint movie. The brilliant guys, you oh, know. Wow. So me re, rewriting or punching up those guys' work, all those guys, I was like, "Oh, brother," <laughs> you know. Yeah. Now, what yeah. what's that like? Like rewriting and punching up jokes lines for movies when compared to like sitcoms and stuff where you're the main guy, like your, your story on sitcoms is probably 90% of what you wrote. You know what I mean? Yeah. That was the thing. It was like way back when I think kind of both paths were, I had connections in each one, but when I, I looked at television, I thought, well, if you become the exec producer, creator, showrunner, you kind of decide your own content. And with films, I mean, unless you become, you know, Woody Allen, where you're writing and directing your own things, they may not even invite you to the premiere. So I felt like, well, television really sort of elevated the creator and uh, film is a director's medium. So I just went into television. I never had any interest in directing, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have no interest in directing, but like I I write scripts just because like, you know, like I'm too scared to send them out because I think, 
like they're going to say they suck, you know, but I enjoy writing and I, I imagine my head, what would it be like if I directed it? It would totally suck. You know what I mean? Well, you know, the thing about directing anything that, you know, if you storyboard the thing and you get great people, you know, it's, it's doable. You know, it's almost like, especially if you're like, I've always felt like comic books mm. have, have sort of taken over a lot of uh, film because they're pre-made storyboards, you know, not mm-hmm. that any, not the directors line up the shots the same with a comic book, but I mean, that's basically what a storyboard has always been. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just a comic book of, mm-hmm. you know, kind of angles and what you want to see, you know, so. But you should, you know, rejection is a part of, it's sort of a good part of it, believe it or not. Oh. Sometimes, you yeah. know, I mean, because it's a subjective thing, which always means you never have to be wrong. Oh. But it, it's... Um, That's true. You know, well, it is true. It's like subject, when, when people speak in absolutes in a in a subjective art form, it's always like, well, I disagree, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm going to send you tonight all my scripts on email. Oh, so, boy. <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, she better raw. Uh... I'm very... Tonight's not good for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question that I had is, um, what was it like, because uh, you started as a stand-up before you started writing on shows like Dennis Miller, where you wrote with your buddies like Drake Sather... And then you moved on to like Chevy Chase and stuff. What was it like writing with your friends compared to writing with actual writers? Well, to tell you the truth, that that Dennis Miller show had a that writing staff was like your show of shows. Um, I, I was that that was one of the most brilliant writing staffs I'd ever be on. It was Barry Crimmins, you know, yeah. um, who's he passed away a couple of years ago, but he was a genius. I mean, him and Kevin Rooney were, uh, two of the most brilliant political minds I'd ever been around. And then, uh, you know, Norm. Oh, I love Norm. Yeah. Norm McDonald, Drake Sather, obviously were two br- just brilliant standups. And then, uh, Cohen and Munchnik were two writers there. They went on to create Will and Grace. I mean, uh, Nick Bakai was there. He runs Mom, and he created the Kaminsky Method. Um, uh, Steve uh, Rudnick and uh, Stephen Leo, Rudnick and Ben Venuti were two of the writers on Dennis Miller. They wrote Space Jam. Um, they wrote a ton of stuff. They wrote the Santa Claus. Um, God, I, I don't want to leave anybody out. Greg Greenberg was a writer there. Eddie Great. Feldman was a writer there. These guys, they, they were all, it was kind of shocking how many writers on that show would go on to become huge, right. you know, just to establish themselves and to have really sort of amazing careers, you know? So then, and I honestly, I know, you know, I remember I sp- honestly spent probably three weeks at Cherry Chase. I was brought in when they, uh, when Fred Wolf quit. Oh, and, I love Fred Wolf. Yeah, Fred Wolf was a brilliant stand-up too, and a brilliant writer. And uh, so I, I was brought in with Eddie Feldman. Uh, said that he, it said that Eddie Feldman and I were going to fix uh, the Chevy Chase show. It said Chevy's in Fox Shop, and uh, you know, honestly, there was no. I love Chevy Chase too. I got to tell you, I had a great time with him, and he was a very nice guy and really funny and pleasant to crew and cast and to everybody. And, um, you know, it was just like one of those things. I, I, I can remember they, my, uh, managers at the time I was at Brillstein gray and they were like, Oh, you can't take this job. It's going to hurt your career. And I was like, well, I need to feed a kid. So I'm going to take the job, you know? And I worked probably three weeks at Cherry Chase and they paid me for, like three or four months because the show got canceled almost immediately, wow. you know, cause it was just, it was just a bizarre sort of occurrence. Well, that's, um, that's what you call a good vacation, huh? It was pretty good. You know, it gave me the time to write other things and to develop other things. I don't, uh, I don't recall 
Well, I met the Turners actually at um, Robin Bakai, who's Nick's wife. I met them at her birthday party, and I sat at a table with them. And uh, somebody brought a nun puppet. Of course, I went to Catholic school, so I had some pre- pretty choice things, bits that I did with that nun puppet sitting at the table, <laughs> and they really liked me. And so, um, you know, round about, I didn't work on a show they did called She TV, which was like a female SNL, but the next show they got was Third Rock. And they asked, they, they sent me the pilot and said, would you be interested in working on us? I was like, absolutely. And, um, wait, but in between there, let's see, I did in living color and that in living color came about because I'd worked for Fox on Chevy Chase. Ooh. So I never would have Living Color had I not. And the Living Color was amazing because it's Jamie Foxx and Jim Carrey. The Wayans brothers were gone by the time I did mm-hmm. that show. But, you know, I mean. Yeah. Uh, do, the yeah. thing I had a question about Living Color was that seems like a show that, I don't know, like I think that it could really have competed with SNL. Like I think that it could have still, you know, there's shows like Mad TV, you know, that they they competed and then they lost and then they rebooted. Like, I think In Living Color should reboot and bring guys like Keith Reza on, you know what I mean? Yes, but, you know, the problem, you know, that's the thing. I think back on, uh, look, SNL has been on the air forever and it's had some really terrible years. Mm-hmm. And I think Fox made a mistake with In Living Color. They should have kept it on oh, every a night at Absolutely. a certain time or, you know, turned that's, it into a franchise that just right. kept, you know, that's right. Just kept discovering people. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I don't know. But do, do you think that, that, uh, that, that has the potential? Like if somebody like, for example, like Mark Brazil wanted to say, Hey, let's reboot, uh, in living color, kind of like how they did mad TV. Do you think that it would help the franchise or do you think that it would hurt it? Because it was so short lived that it's considered great. If it lasted longer, would it still be considered great? I think, well, I think Keenan and Damon tried to reboot it Mm -hmm. and I'm not really sure what happened. You know, um, honestly, I've, I've been, uh, trying to do a sketch show, like whatever it's, you know, there is no like, but it's, I, I've been trying to develop one, uh, like a, a Dave Chappelle or a Amy Schumer type show for Eddie Pepitone for quite a while oh, now with wow. Steve Lowe. Love Eddie Pepitone. Yeah. Wow. Alan's you obsessed know, with Eddie Pepitone. Oh, yeah, I like Eddie and I, well, I like Eddie. Eddie's a good guy. He's just a straight up guy. I love his stuff. Uh-huh. Oh, he's one of my favorite comics and he's such a great actor too. He's oh, such geez. You know, now you just was, that you, bitter Buddha was hilarious. Here, that it's oh, told, yeah, I told you about that. Yeah, it was it's fun. Just, uh, bio, <laughs> film and uh, he, uh, you, you just got back into you were telling me you just got back to comedy within the past four or five years. Uh, what, what's that like from transitioning from you know being huge in the 80s and mid 90s and then just coming back into it? Because when I saw you, you destroyed like you, it seemed like you didn't even stop, you know. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that was like amazing. I thought um, the SLO festival, I did not see a weak link. I, I was always like, holy shit. The, the comics there were, I, I was always impressed with all the shows I was on. I was amazed at how great the comics were because a lot of times in LA, you, you go where you go and you see a lot of, you know, we used to call them spokes models. Right. Um, they were like, I'm an actor and I have my one person show and I also uh, do mime and, uh, Oh, I'm a standup. And it's like, okay, well, you're not doing any of those. Well, and you're just taking the stage time away from people who actually want to do it and they're good at it. But anyway, you know what I mean? It's like, you see a lot of open mics where you just like, Oh, it's, it's exhausting. Kind of, but it's not different. It's, it's always LA has always been like that. Yeah. You see people and, and you're just like, you're just a fucking haircut. I'm sorry. That's, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, that SLO festival, I was like, holy shit, there's people with a point of view with brilliant material who actually like doing it and are good at it. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was fun. I thought you were brilliant, Keith. We, I forget where the three hounds or I forget which club we were at, but, uh, 
yeah, I was like really so kind of ecstatic and hopeful after the festival because I thought, wow, this there's so many great comics. And a lot of times going to a lot, because I'll go anywhere too. And I'm not some fucking guy who's, Oh, it's got to, you know, I'm not getting spots at the improv at uh, 9.30 on Friday. Even though I've been at the improv, I've been at the store over my career. But really, it's like I love really terrible open mics sometimes because I feel like, man, you're digging yourself out of a hole before you even go up. <laughs> it's kind of amusing to me, you know, to, to go into these, to go into terrible rooms and just um, really you're just trying to make the other comics come up, you know, because the, there's like four people in the audience. So what's it matter? But, uh, yeah, it, it was really, it, it's been great because I have nothing to prove now. I can say whatever I want. I'm not trying to get, you know, dual time on ABC. Um, I, I can, I can tell, I've gotten to an age where I really honestly could just tell my truth. Right. You know? Wow. Nice. Well, the thing is, like, I've always wanted to do stand up, and I feel like I've gotten so good is because the people who I toured with and mentored me, like, they, they really, they rode me hard like a whore. You know what I mean? Like, Norm, uh, and then I was with Jeremy Hotz and Jay Moore, and like, they said, you gotta get, you gotta get to the point where you're funnier than me. So, oh, that's, that's fantastic, though. That's the way it used to be, though. I mean, I, I cut my teeth at the store in like 1984, 85. And, you know, that was a, a school of comedy that, I mean, uh, I can't even remember all the, well, Kennison was there, but Kathy Ladman, Carrie Snow, Lois Bromfield, you know, um, Alan Stevens. These were like brilliant people that would tell you, you, you know, you could do better with that joke. That joke's not really, you know what I mean? It was like, they were willing to, teach you how to do it because you're opening for them. Mm -hmm. You have to be better. Yeah. You know, people don't, really, you know, you got to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with people nowadays to, to get them to actually tell you the truth. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's way more, feels way more sink or swim to me now. Um, but back then it was, it was, I was mentored by brilliant fucking people. The Mitzi had brilliant people, but then Mitzi hated me. You know, she was like, she she never would pass me. She was not going to pass me. That's how I wound up working for Bud most of the time. And that was I can think back on. I would get Melrose spots all the time, and the highlight was probably I opened for Bill Maher on New Year's Eve. And if you got booked on New Year's Eve at the Improv on Melrose, man, it was it was nice. Yeah. No, you big know, deal. I uh... um, but Norm, Norm is brilliant, man. Norm, you know. When we were at, working on the Miller show, Drake and I and Eddie Feldman, there were a few of us, we, we'd write like 20 jokes a day. Um, but Norm would write three. <laughs> However, one was so perfect and probably the most brilliant thing you'd ever heard. So it was just like, yeah, that's it. Yeah, let try this, this, this. <laughs> You know. <laughs> he, was, uh, he, was, he was always, you know, just, you know, brilliant. But, uh, well, it's nice to know he was always like that. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was not, you know, he, he was not, he was not a worker bee, but he was so brilliant. It didn't really matter. You know, I mean, uh -huh. hey, hey, hey. we would carpool every day. Drake and Norm and I would carpool to Dennis Miller every day. And it, it's, you know, uh, it's kind of, it's the other thing, thinking about Drake on Dennis Miller, Drake was a brilliant writer. Drake was on news radio. He was on Larry Sanders and he wrote Zoolander. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, I'm, yeah. a, I'm obsessed with, uh, Drake Sather as a comic because his jokes, uh, were so perfect. He did the 1987 young comedian special. Uh, Spade was yeah. there. Fred Stoller, uh, Warren Thomas. It was hosted by Dennis Miller and Drake Sather was the funniest one on that show. And his yeah. jokes and, were just uh, perfect. Rob Schneider was on that one too. Yeah, yeah. Back when Rob yeah, Schneider um, was funny. <laughs> uh, Rob was, you know, Rob was always like mean. <laughs> he just fucking always mean. Man. Drake Sather was like one of the purest, most honest stand-ups too, and just knew how to tell jokes. He was on Letterman and everything, but you know, Drake had a joke. Well, was a th I put it on a thread on Facebook when we were talking about Barney. Warren also was like a fucking charismatic, brilliant guy. 
But Drake's like, if people want me to save the whales, I can't even get my wife to stop fucking other guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we fucking, we got booked together so many times. I, that was like one of the joys of my life was, you know, uh, getting booked with Drake. We did the half hour comedy hour in New York City and, and we're together. We did all the improvs together. He was, he truly, I, it, it breaks my heart that he's not here. He has he, he died probably 17 years ago. And yeah. I can't imagine all that he could have done. Cause you know, he was like one of Stiller and Apatow's best friends and everybody knew how brilliant he was. We all knew he was the one, you know? Yeah. yeah. And like, I see a lot of comics, like, you know how, like when Mitch Hedberg died, like everyone, like, kind of you see yeah. you see at open mics they kind of like take his jokes and act like they're their jokes you know what i mean and no one really knows yeah. who mitch hedberg is like the audience wise you know what i'm saying but comics know well, he, sure. he was such a brilliant writer man he Amazing. was like the he was uh, i mean i don't think he's one of the greatest joke writers that ever did this yeah and, and it was people think it was like it, his sort of persona and it's like no he he really did know how to write some of the most brilliant one-liners you know i loved mitch he did a he he was on 70s i don't know if you know that i didn't know was he on just yeah, an mitch, episode well no i wanted mitch to do the show um because we knew each other and I, dave becky was a good friend of mine and um and i was like I, I wanted Mitch to be like, if you watch Happy Days, my show was just fucking Happy Days with weed. And I wanted uh, Mitch to be like the Al Molinera who who ran the uh, hamburger joint that they all hung out at. Yeah. You know, and I, I wanted Mitch to just be that guy who ran the place, who hated these kids and was just like bitter as shit, you know. And uh, I wrote a joke for Mitch because I tried to write like Mitch for the character he was going to play. Cause I'm, I'm of the mind that, you know, Roseanne and Roseanne and Tim Allen, when they first got their shows, it's like the brilliance of Matt Williams was I'm going to write for them because they already have a character. Right. You know? I'm not going to ask them to be fucking Brando. And, uh, so I wrote a joke for Mitch and I'm, I'm still like proud of it. I could write a joke like Mitch for the show, but it was like, uh, Kelso Ashton goes, uh, Hey Mitch, where's my hot dog? He was like the guy who ran the hub on seventies for, for an episode. And he, he's like, Mitch, where's my hot dog? And he goes, Kelso, I did not lose a leg in Vietnam. The serves not those kids hot dog. <laughs> and, uh, Kelso goes, but Mitch, you got both your legs. And Mitch goes, I said I did not lose a leg in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if you watch the episode, you know, Mitch was never, like, comfortable socially being a, you know, he was there every day. He did his job. He did a great job. He actually talked about it in one of his specials. He's like, and I'm going to paraphrase the joke because I can't remember exactly. He goes, stand-up comedy is the only thing where they that you are a stand-up comic, so now you will be an actor. <laughs> said, you would never be painting someone's house and go, I like the way you paint. You will fix my plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So, you know, uh, and I, I mean, he just didn't want, you know, he didn't like hanging out on the set. I don't think he liked being around people all day long. I think the life of a comic is really hard to give up because truly you get to do whatever you want mm -hmm. except for like two hours a night, you yeah. know? I mean, and, I uh, I never met Mitch, but I mean, I just have a theory just by watching his stand-up and stuff. I, I, I feel like when you have autism, you could tell who else has autism. It's kind of like gaydar. So I feel like he had a form of autism as well, you know? Like he strikes yeah, me as a very I, unsocial. I yeah. Yeah, he he was um he but he did that thing. He was just I you know, actually Mitch was I think it was 
I'd have to say it's a gift because he was kind of effortless in the way he could just be funny all the time in every situation. He was born to it. He was a, he was a God among stand-ups, you know? I mean, he has so much material where you, you just go, Jesus, how to... He could have been Carlin, you know, and without... Because mm-hmm. he had such a sweet way about him, though, and yet still brilliantly, brutally funny. Yeah. You know? Um. Another well, another question I had is, uh, did you, when you casted the 70s show, did you know that Topher Grace or Ashton Kutcher would be as huge as they are right now? No, I had no idea. I knew that, um, you know, it's strange because Topher was, uh, the Turners knew him because he knew their daughter. And I knew Topher as the guy who used to hang around at Third Rock and go, you know, I don't even know. I think he's like fucking getting coffee and just hanging out. He liked being around actors and writers. And then like a season or two later, they're like, no, you know that guy? He's going to read for the part that's basically based on me. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. You know, not, I mean, I didn't know he was an actor. But then, you know, he came in and read and you're like, oh, fuck, man. Because he was so effortless and he underplayed stuff and he he wasn't sweaty like you know he didn't he didn't hammer punch lines he threw them away he had such a deft touch with comedy um that he just read one time and i was like yeah that's like you build everything around him because he's got the kind of snarky sort of you know that he was just i was always the first time he read from me i was like jesus christ this guy's brilliant and the same with ashton ashton came in and it was, I think, Bonnie Turner, Marcy Carsey, myself. I maybe Terry was there. I know that it was like towards the end of the day, and it was really hard to find that guy. Kelso was like a real guy who who was like my best friend growing up, yeah. and he was good looking, and he fell for. He would just step on his dick every time with women, and um. So when Ashton came in. I'm like, this is this guy's not going to be funny. I really did think that because he was like a model from Calvin Klein, and I thought there's no way he's going to be funny. Right. And um, that was my own sort of prejudice because he's good looking, and it's that's like fucking impossible to find. Same with Mila Kunis; she's beautiful. Laura, you know, they were all. But he read, and then he, he's like, his agent his agency and I forget who they were. They were like, NBC is going to make a deal with him in 15 minutes to do wind on water, which was some Bo Derek show about two boys who their mom owns a fucking macadamia plantation in Hawaii. I don't even remember that, but wind on water was a go project with Bo Derek and he was going to play Bo Derek's son. And everybody at NBC and everybody was like telling him, you're not funny, man. Yeah. You're, you're, you're too good looking to be funny. And he's like, you guys, so they're offering this thing. Well, I don't know what to do. And they're saying I'm not funny. And we're like, we're fucking saying you are funny. And if you want this, we'll make a deal right now. The problem was Marcy Carsey and Tom Warner were going to have to just make the deal because we're competing with Wind on Water at NBC. And we had like 15 or 15 minutes or a half hour to make the deal. And if you make the deal, you got to kind of go through with it. The problem was we didn't know if Fox would like him. Right. Nor- normally, you have, you know, well, obviously, everybody has to be approved by the network. So we made the deal thinking, look, we, ca- we kind of know what we love, and we kind of know that this part has not been easy to cast, and we were all pretty sure that this was the guy. And so, you know, you know you'll never know what would have happened if we'd done Wind on Water. It lasted like one season. Some people have a trajectory that you're just lucky enough to be in the orbit of, and it doesn't matter what they do. Look, I did Chevy Chase. There's lots of things that don't work out. It doesn't mean you won't do something else. Right. But uh, obviously, he was perfect for that show. He's perfect for that part. And all of them were sort of perfect for the part because the better I got to know all of them, and four of them had never really acted in anything before, the better you got to know them, the more you'd bend the writing towards what they could do, what their strengths were and sort of who they were, yeah. you know? 
And I and, think uh, I think that's why that show lasted. I mean, I think it lasted what two hundred and ten episodes, or maybe even more. It's actually it's actually exactly two hundred. It was on the air eight years, and I, you know, we averaged out to twenty five a year. Sometimes more. Sometimes there were more. Sometimes there were less. We were doing like, you know. I Love Lucy, they do 35 episodes a year and have their two weeks off like any normal sort of people. But we, we were doing like, up, I think 27 was the most I ever did in one year. Wow. And uh, that's like unheard of now. Um, I'm, I mean, but a sitcom lends itself to theater, lends itself to, you know, that, was, that show was a hybrid. I don't know if people realize that, but I used to film, you know, 15 or 20 pages on Thursday with a, with a, without an audience. And then I'd run that, I'd edit it rough cut Friday morning. I'd show it back to the audience. Um, Friday night, I'd get the laughs for it. And studio. I, I was shot in the same studio as Mary, Mary Tyler Moore and Roseanne, a very lucky studio. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it was like half was filmed without an audience. And then half was filmed live. And those, all of them were brilliant live. You know, they really um, were energized by that. Interesting. Which is the thing I kind of miss about sitcoms. Is, wow. You know, there, there was a certain immediacy and energy. And, um, you know, you'd, you'd do it from, you'd hear the table on Monday and you'd put it to bed Friday night. And then you'd start over again. Yeah. So. Uh, Mark, I had a question about the uh, what kind of hierarchy or what kind of how do the writers get together? Like, you know, uh, you're the head writer. Is it like a uh, uh, an improv group of writers where the input of one writer is is checked off, and then you'd say, "Well, we can use that." And is it is well, it is it a give and take uh, 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 structured like I don't want to say a car assembly, but you know, one guy does a tire and then you just know, you know what I'm saying? This was, it was completely, the seventies was completely collaborative in the sense. Collaborative. There was, there was like 12 of us, you know, there's the showrunner who's always going to be the be all end all on it. Okay. And, um, you know, I was the showrunner for like the first four or five years and then I kind of backed out of it and the last three years I had really nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, but what what we would do is, you know, you go in there like two months before the season, and you have all 12 or whatever the writing staff is, you break out the arcs you want to do that season for each character. You say, well, this is what's going to happen to this one. You do that collectively as a room. And then you would say, now everybody pitch me stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and they would they would pitch you stories and stories would fall into three categories, an A story, which is the main story, the B, mm -hmm. and the C story, which was usually, we'd call it a C runner, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the C runner was usually just something, uh, a, good, a good example of a C runner in one of the episodes was, um, I had never seen Kurtwood Smith and Ashton really do much with each other, and so we specifically wrote a C story for the two of them, and the story was, um, Kelso had a pong game and it broke and he, I forget exactly how the story went, but, but red was like, well, you don't throw something away like a piece of junk. You fix it. <laughs> and, and Kelso was like, how do I fix it? And so red's like, Oh Jesus. You know? So red and Kelso take sure. the pong game apart sure. and they realize it's got like a circuit board in sure. it. And so they fixed it, and it was really just about soldering a connection that had gone bad. And um, at the end of the C story, um, Kelso goes, uh, thanks, Red, thanks for teaching me. He goes, you're welcome, Kelso. Now remember this. This right here, this is the future. <laughs> and um, Kelso <laughs> goes, he's like, yeah, video games, man. <laughs> and Red goes, it's not video game, dumbass. It's soldering. Learn how to solder. <laughs> That's great. I see what you're saying. God, it's great to see you. Uh, that, uh, 
that was just like a really kind of mm-hmm. fun. Uh, nothing really happened. Sure, it doesn't have a, you know yeah. import. Sure, um, but it was like a great way to get these two great actors together for a show. Sure, you know that's great. um that's a great explanation. I appreciate that. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so people would pitch their stories. They would be divided up into three categories, mm-hmm. and then you would mix and match them. And mm-hmm. it didn't matter who pitched the story; they'd Beautiful. be assigned it. They'd go off to write the first draft, which I always had a sort of a thing I'd say to every writer, which is if you go write your first draft and you only get the script to about 50 or 60 percent, I'm only going to add 20 to it. Mm-hmm. So if you get it to 50 or 60, I can take it up hopefully to 70 percent, and then we don't have to rewrite it all week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if you get me to 70, I'll take it to 90, and we all have a nice easy week, and we get to go home and have dinner. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. So, you know, that was just kind of, I was always two months ahead on my scripts. I always had plenty of time for the network to sign off on it. The really nice thing about that show, too, was because the four of them were kids who had never really done it before. I had said early on, you can't throw a bunch of changes at these guys. Right. You got to kind of go with what they, you know. What they can I need do, notes yeah. at the table read, and I need notes in the process before that because they I would say they couldn't memorize it. And the truth was, after the first season, they could have memorized everything. Right. But it, it just started a precedent where the network really didn't give a ton of notes on the on the episodes, which was really lucky and good, you know? Um, with all these uh, with all these shows uh, being, like, rebooted and remade, like Roseanne and um, Mad About You, do you think that 70s show has that potential to be rebooted like that? I, I kind of don't just because it's such a, I don't know how you'd find that cast again. I really don't. That was like lightning yeah. uh, in a bottle, mm-hmm. and that's really hard to redo. And, you know, I got burned really badly on 80s, on that 80s show, which I never really wanted to do, but the, the, net, the network was like, well, you're contractually obligated, and they kept pitching it. Mm-hmm. They go, no, it's going to be a franchise. And I was like, no, it's it's not like SVU or or Special Victims or you know Law and Order. I said it's just mm-hmm. a different animal. I've never they they wanted me to be Norman Lear, and I really didn't think like Norman Lear. Norman Lear, they tried to spin off Laura and Mila. They oh. wanted they said, look, we're going to do this, and I was like, well, you no, you're not going to do that because Tom and Marcy would never have done that. You know, it's like you don't. It took a long time to find those two women. Right. So they're no, it's like Laverne and Shirley. I go, yeah, Laverne and Shirley were two guest stars. Mm-hmm. Cindy Williams having been on American Graffiti, mm-hmm. and they they didn't have anything to do with Happy Days. They were two guest stars, the same as Robin Williams as Mork. You know, it's That's easy right. to, you know, spin off somebody who's not a member of a cast. Mm-hmm. So that's where '80s came from. They're like, no, it's a franchise. It'll work. And I was like, it's going to be compared to a show that's really popular. It's not going to work. But, uh, you know, we, you we have to do what you have well, to do. That's interesting. We, that's, should, that's we should pitch that 90s show. <laughs> somebody, I, somebody just said that today online, and they, you know, referenced oh. my name in it. And I was like, yeah, that probably <laughs> won't work. <laughs> uh, um. Oh my. I think that somebody was me. <laughs> oh, my God. Was, was it? Yeah, was it you? Jesus. I don't know. <laughs> that 90s show would be, yeah, it'd be uh, <laughs> the death. It starts with the death of Kurt Cobain and then gets really sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Well, Mark, we're running oh, out of time. Great. but uh, is great. Uh, we're running out of time, but the last thing we end on uh, every single show and uh, uh, with this question, and it might be very weird. But uh, it's a question we ask every single guest. Have you ever met John Cusack? Uh, no, but I met Jeremy Piven. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. What was that like? <laughs> Piven is to John Cusack as David Spade is to Chris Farley. <laughs> That's oh, true. Man. That is 100% wow. true. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, so where can the folks at home follow you? You know, I don't really do any of that. I, I'm on Twitter, but, you know, when I really want to say something, I say it under an alias. <laughs> I mean, huh. I'm on Instagram. It's it's really mostly my Instagram is, is for my dog, Pickles. Oh. And for me to, um, you know, just do some prophecy about the upcoming death of all billionaires. <laughs> so you can find me on there. Right. Uh, That's always fun. And I'm on Facebook. But I, I I tell you, when social media and the internet was taking off, I had bailed on Hollywood and was living on a ranch in Ojai for like nice. ten years. Nice. Yeah, I walked away. Well, if this uh, epidemic thing ever goes away, oh, and I'm scheduled to do Irvine, but I don't know if that'll happen. If I get rescheduled or whatever, I would love for you to come out and do a set with me, man. That would be awesome, man. Are you going to the improv? There? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's in July, so hopefully things are better. <laughs> well, I think it's going to get better, and I think I think it's going to happen. People, you know, life's just going to be different, but it's 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 all going to be fine, you know. All right, well, I'll let, I'll let you know the date, and uh, we'll have fun. We'll do stand-up and make people laugh. That would be great, man. All right, Mark, I love you very much. Thank you for doing Thank the show. Thank you, Mark. Now. The maestro. I love you, Keith. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Al. Yes, sir. All right. Bye, Mark. I'll talk. Take it. Bye. All right. That was a great Mark Brazil, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you. Um, Phone difficulties, but still a great interview. You know, I think people out there, fans of this show, will learn more about comedy and, and the process than any other podcast out there. <laughs> That's a bold statement. <laughs> Isn't it, though? Is that a fucking bold statement? That's but a bold I think it's statement. True. I think it's true. Well, guys, we uh, uh, <laughs> we will keep on doing uh, episodes yeah. as long as we can. Uh, stay healthy during this time and laugh. Subscribe, brain review. That's right. Uh, give us some good feedback. Mm. Um, like I said, my stand-up special comes out tomorrow. You can buy that on Sony and Mad Records. And I'll plug it away. Uh, like the show, raise a riffs, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Apple Podcast, subscribe, Apple Podcast. right, rate right, review. Book me on Celebrity Voicemail at Keith Reza. We like, should get you like on us? Celebrity Voicemail. Please do, please do. Uh, uh, and th- do they like us enough on our YouTube? Do they hit the likes? Hit the oh, like. I don't care where you hit the likes. That would Wherever, be cool. just hit that like button, hit, please. Yeah, we're very insensitive, and we need a sensitive. No, I, I, that's the wrong word. We're very insecure. insecure. Ah, yeah. we're angry. We're angry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, follow Mark yeah. Brazil, guys. Yes, sir. And uh, you know, follow us. And hey, stay healthy. Uh, stay time. safe. All right, guys. Bye, Rifters. You're listening to Razor Riffs with Keith Razor and Alan Lee right here on LA Talk Radio.